Hey guys, it's Nate here with another video. This time we're gonna cover best practices in structuring your SQL code. So good structure in your code allows you and others to understand what the code is actually doing. It helps you and others to understand the logic that you've built into your code, whether or not you're on a job interview or you're just on the job doing work. So we're gonna cover six topics. All right, so let's get down to it. If you like content like this, please subscribe to this channel. Thanks. All right, so we're gonna use this question as an example here, premium versus freemium. It's a data science interview question on the Stratascratch platform. I put a link in the description below. So if you want to, you can access this question and also just follow along with me as we're refactoring the code. So let me just read the question really quick. We're not gonna go over how to build the solution. I'll present you a solution uh, to this question, but just for context, uh, what the question is saying or asking is, Find the total number of downloads for paying and non-paying users by date. Include only records where non-paying customers have more downloads than paying customers. The output should be sorted by earliest date first containing three columns, date, non-paying downloads, and paying downloads. So really what we're trying to do here with, with the data that they give us, and they gave us basically three tables to work with, we are trying to manipulate the data such that we have um, an understanding of the non-paying downloads, the paying downloads, and then aggregating that by date. All right, so that's kind of the, the logic that will be presented in the code itself. And so if you want to actually take a look at the official solution, we have it in this um, tab right here called solution discussions, and it basically gives you a very optimal solution, right? And so not everybody obviously has this solution or comes up with this solution on the first try. So if you wanna see what other people, other users of the platform has, has actually written, uh, you'll see it in this solutions from users tab here. All of these are the correct uh, solution. They're validated by our validation engine. Uh, but as you can see, they're all very, very different. All of these solutions um, are just, they just have different logic, different syntax, uh, but they're all correct in some way or another. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab one of these user solutions, something that is not very optimal, and then we're, we're, we'll discuss it and then we'll just refactor it to become an optimal solution. All right, so this is the solution that I picked from the solutions from users tab. It's a pretty ugly solution in my opinion. It's very long, it's confusing with all of these nested queries, um, and I just don't really understand why the logic is kind of like laid out like this, right? So I wouldn't really expect this from somebody that's coming from industry, and I also wouldn't really expect this even from somebody that's learning still, right? I mean, it's kind of showing that you don't have a lot of experience writing code. So let's start refactoring this code. All right, so the first thing I wanna start with is all of these nested queries here. So I'm seeing um, this right here, and then this query P, and then this query S. Um, I could follow this logic, it's not that difficult, but it kind of is weird to me that it's kind of just deep into the, the entire solution already, right? It doesn't present you with an understanding of how to think about the, the logic, and that's kind of what is missing to me. Um, I don't necessarily like subqueries so much, so what I typically do is add it to the top. I create a CTE or a common table expression. This is something that could be done if you're on a Postgres database. Um, if you're not on one, uh, if you're on something like more industry grade, like Hive, or if you're on like MySQL, you can create temporary tables and put them at the top. But what's important is really an understanding that this is kind of how you should be manipulating the data first before you go and uh, apply other business logic or other logic to your solution. So to me, they should actually be at the top because that's the first thing I wanna take a look at is how I'm manipulating the data set before other logic is applied. So this is what I would do. I'm on a Postgres database, so I'm gonna create CTEs. This is what it's gonna look like. So I am just gonna move basically this P 
um, up here. And then I'll also grab this N, put it here. And then there is an S right here, I guess is uh, this thing right here. All right, so I have P, N, and S CTEs, or what will be these uh, CTEs. And then I have essentially the, the major um, select clause at the very bottom, right? That's kind of like what will be executed and what will be um, outputted at the very end. And that should be at the bottom. All right, so let me clean up the CTEs real quick so they can actually execute. All right, so I have P with P as, and then I have that P nested query that you saw before. So basically I'm identifying a pacing, uh, paying customer. And then I have N, which is identifying uh, a non-paying customer. And then I basically am joining P and N together. Um, and I have um, a CTE called S. And then I need to now kind of refactor the, this part of the code here to use one of these tables. So I'm actually going to be using the S table because that's the joining of the P and N. And I think everything is okay. Let's run the query and let's see. Okay, so I have something right now. It's not bad, uh, right? It's, it's what the solution is. Um, it executes, but what's most important here um, is you wanna remove nested queries, especially those sub queries at the very bottom because it's just confusing. Right now, what you can what you see is essentially logic from top to bottom. I am identifying the paying customer. That's super obvious. I am identifying the non-paying customer. Super obvious. Um, and then uh, performing this logic, um, and then performing the last uh, kind of logical statement that gives me the output. Right now, the ordering is right. So let's move on to the second best practice. This one I'll call ensuring consistent aliases. So one thing that I don't really like with this solution is I don't understand what P is, what N is, what S is, right? So the first thing I can actually just do is just write down what it actually is. I, if I'm identifying a paying customer here, I'll just call the CTE paying. I'll call this one non-paying. And I'll call uh, this bottom one um, because they're both paying and non-paying together, I'm just gonna call it all downloads. Another thing I wanna do is not use this A, B, C kind of nomenclature for aliases. I feel like it can get very confusing if you're just using a random letter to, to alias a table. I think it needs to be a little bit more descriptive than that. So what I'll do is, because this is the user dimension table, I'm just gonna alias it with uh, users. And then for the account dimension table here, I'll just call it accounts, alias it with an accounts. Uh, so that way this is users, and then this is um, accounts. And then I'm gonna do that for everything. So I've basically re-aliased all of the tables and columns. But basically what I'm doing is I'm actually just adding descriptive aliases to these tables. So I already explained this paying one. And so this non-paying CTE, basically I'm following the exact same uh, nomenclature. I have the same table, so I'm aliasing it with you know users, accounts, downloads. And then for every column that I'm uh, calling, I also have the table alias in there as well, right? So this tells me exactly what table and what column is being called. And I have this in the select clause as well. Um, I just basically have this everywhere in my code. So that is a very, very important best practice to have, especially uh, if you come back to your code like six months later or if somebody else tries to read their, your code, they know what these tables mean. They also know which columns and table you're actually uh, grabbing from. It's very, very explicit in this code and that's exactly what you want. The only reason why I may not have it here in this bottom one is because I'm only calling one table. So you know that this date, non-paying and paying columns, they all come from this all downloads table. 
right? So that's very easy to understand. It's not very easy to understand with the other uh, uh, CTEs that I have because I have multiple joins going on. So that makes it kind of confusing. All right, so another really quick thing that I just saw is this person did not uh, name every column. Uh, that's really not good either. So the sum needs to, to actually have a name. So I'm just gonna call this um, as an paying. And then same here, uh, I see this person are, did in fact actually name their column. So it was really just this part uh, that didn't have a name. So this one's called non-paying. Okay, so far so good. So let's move on to sort of like the third best practice. The third thing that I'm seeing uh, that's not necessarily great practice is all of these order buys here. There is no reason to have uh, one, two, three, four order buys. I think you can really just get away with one order buy, which would be at the very end of your code, which would be right here, right? This is the main output. This could have the order buy, but you really don't need to have it um, in all of these CTEs. So eliminate unnecessary execution of code to better optimize your code. That's really the best practice here. This is a major one. This is very unoptimized code. We have uh, three CTEs, and if you kind of can read what it's doing, we're just identifying the paying customer, we're identifying a non-paying customer, and then we're joining these two tables together so that we have both the non-paying and the paying customer. Now ask yourself, is there a better way to actually write this code? Is there a better way to do this? I feel like this is a perfect use case to have a case statement. Why wouldn't we have a case statement that looks something like this where we can identify a paying customer? And then the next case would be not identifying a non-paying customer. And then the other statement, if you actually need it, is to have both customers there. Right, that would actually just eliminate all of the CTEs and you just really end up with one instead of three. So this is what it would look like. Okay, see, one CTE now instead of three. So I'm just calling this CTE all downloads. I have this case statement here that just identifies the paying customer and basically sums it up, sums out how many paying customers I have. And then um, I have the same thing, but I'm identifying non-paying customers. All, and then basically it all is executed in this all download CTE. And then I still have the date, the number of non-paying, the number of paying customers, and everything's super short. It's super logical to understand what's going on and it's highly optimized at this point. Okay, now let's move on to the next topic. This is to me, to me very easy to read, uh, highly optimized, but it can get even better. All right, so where I'm kind of focused now is on this having clause here. And so you should ask yourself, is a having clause necessary or can I get away with a, using a where clause? So what's the difference between a having clause and a where clause? Having clause to me are really reserved uh, for when this expression here has an aggregate function attached to it. So if I really wanted to do like a sum or a count or something like that where I'm using a function, this is exactly when I would be implementing a having clause. But the thing is I, I don't have that. What I'm actually doing is I'm taking the difference between these two variables and I'm seeing if it's greater than zero. That's all I'm doing. I could actually get away with a where clause here. Why does this actually matter? The where clause is executed when this entire query is executed. A having clause is executed after this query is executed. So you're basically just making the query take a little bit longer to execute. And so it's not very optimized at that point. Again, these are small little nuances, right? But it's actually very important to understand um, how to better optimize uh, your code because it's always gonna be asked in an interview. And then if you're working in industry and working with millions and billions of rows, these little things actually do add up to a lot of time. Okay, and so now the last part of um, best practices to structure code is actually just one final look through. Um, I'm just uh, seeing very small you know, things that you can just optimize for. Um, and it's really just structuring of your code, right? So what I like to do is just make sure that um, everything is in line and I have you know, one column per line, like just like I have here. 
the group buy, you know, I've seen, you know, people have it in um, either one line or uh, in uh, different lines. I don't really care. Um, I, I always kind of look at the select clause here because I, I just feel like um, it's easier to read when each column is on a different line. So when I'm finalizing my code for work, that's kind of like what I'm trying to do. For an interview, you know, this, this step doesn't really matter. It's not important uh, to be focusing on that. Uh, but it really does show that, you know, you know how to write industry level code. You probably worked with other people that have, you know, same the same standards you, you do. You probably have some industry experience maybe. So everything kind of compounded together results in some really nice, very efficient and very optimal code. Okay, so that's basically it here. We went over about six different uh, ways to optimize your code. Uh, to really conform uh, your code to the best practices in industry uh, that will help you basically um, on a job interview, um, on the job itself, to give the perspective that you know you understand best practices, you've worked with others, you have some experience writing code. And that's kind of the point of this video here. So that's it for me today. If you have any questions about best practices uh, in structuring your code and writing, writing your code out, please drop a comment uh, below. Otherwise, I will be creating another video in the upcoming weeks. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please subscribe to this channel. Thanks. Thank you.